places. So before we begin, let me tell you a little bit about Frederic. Frederic Lavaupierre was the director of education at the Santa Barbara Botanic Garden, where she shares where she shared her enthusiasm enthusiasm for native plants and insects. Prior to working at the garden, she was the founding director of the Sustainable Landscape Professional Certificate Program at Sonoma State University, where she also revived the garden classroom program. Frederic holds, holds a Master of Science in Biology with an emphasis on ecological principles of sustainable landscapes. Prior to her graduate work, she founded and operated an organic nursery specializing in heirloom vegetables and culinary herbs from around the world. She serves on the editorial advisory group for the American Public Gardens Association magazine and Public Gardens. Frederic is on the board of the Pacific Horticulture. She is on the board of Pacific Horticulture. Excuse me. She is also an associate at the Mendocino Coast Botanical Gardens, which she just told us is beautiful. So put it on your list of places to go. And I will disappear. Frederic has a wonderful program for you. So enjoy. Sit back and get your questions ready. Thanks, every. Thanks, everyone. Um, this is an introduction to life in the landscape, and I want to thank you for that nice introduction. I always begin by crediting the illustrator of this book, Craig Lacker. He's a landscape architect and has done over 150 drawings for the book. And I credit all the photos that were taken by others. If the photos don't have credits, they are mine. And this is a new drawing, actually, that you're seeing for the first time because it's not in the book. It's for the next book. These are native longhorn bees on sunflowers. So I am going to show you a few more of these pretty pictures and give you a basic outline of how the talk will go. I am going to give you a bit of science before we get back to the pretty pictures. And I do want to tell you that I have an unintended audience of children who like to color these pictures in. So let's get started with a few nice pictures. Uh, and these are kind of laid out in the same order as my book, Life Beneath Our Feet, which is about life in the soil. Flower visitors, which will include pollinators among other things. Digging deeper, we're going to explore a little bit about parasitism and predation. Meet the beetles is self-explanatory and we only have time to meet a couple of them really. Uh, Garden Commons is like that closet where you throw all the stuff you don't know what to do with. And so this will be a number of familiar insects. Many more are in the book than what we will cover here. The ground crew and beyond includes a number of non-insect critters that you might find in your garden. The vertebrates, which will include some things that we would like to have. I don't welcome deer personally. So now I'm going to just throw you into the science that supports the kind of pest management and the kind of food web approach to gardening that I like. Usually when we are thinking about garden allies, we're thinking about pollinators, right? And we are going to be looking at a lot of other things. And I really like to focus on the pest management because I think it's wonderful if people can reduce or eliminate their pesticide use. If you're familiar with integrated pest management, you will know that you start over on the left-hand side of this chart, which with things like mechanical, physical, and cultural control that don't have a huge impact on the environment. This chart is adapted from UC Davis's IPM department. And you see that you can go all the way to conventional pesticides. And for me, the key is, is that this chart is really based on commercial enterprises, agriculture and commercial horticulture. And so it's based on cost benefit analyses. If you're a farmer, you need to put food on the table for your family. For we gardeners, it's a little bit different. We have an aesthetic, um, an aesthetic threshold that we want to meet rather than the economic one. 
So let's look at these three kinds of biological control. Usually we're thinking about classical biological control when we think biocontrol. This gentleman here, Charles Valentine Riley, was the father of biological control in the United States. And what he did is that we had here in California, this horrible insect, the cottony cushion scale. It doesn't even really look like an insect. And he asked, where did this insect come from? It almost destroyed the citrus industry in California around the late 1800s, early 1900s. And he discovered that the cottony cushion scale was from Australia and had the bright idea that let's go there and see if there's something that preys on this insect. But his boss wouldn't let him go. So he sent a staff member to go and see an exhibition in Australia with a secret mission, find whatever eats these scale insects. And the staff member came back with the Vidalia beetle, which you can probably guess is related to ladybugs and also a parasitic fly. Later on, we found out this really only works under specific conditions. Specifically, it works best in a perennial system like an orchard, and it can be quite expensive. And the reason it's expensive is because we have learned since these insects were brought back in a little vial in somebody's coat pocket, that there is always a risk that something is going to switch to another prey. And so the testing is rather extensive now on the part of the US Department of Agriculture. So this is really not ideal for us as gardeners. It may be that you have a heritage oak tree in your garden or some other kind of tree and it's being attacked by something and your arborist says, you know, this little package here of wasps will solve your problem, but it's $80. So we can generally avoid this sort of biological control as gardeners. Then we have augmentative biological control. And so this is when you buy little bags of ladybugs. And um, I would suggest that's not a wonderful idea uh, for reasons that you can read about in the book, but basically they are a migratory insect and they migrate from the Central Valley in California into the Sierra and then back again. And they are genetically programmed to fly away. So they aren't very effective. And you, I'm going to show you, can you can attract all kinds of species of ladybugs into your garden by planting some of the flowers that they like. So this is the kind of biological control that I favor and that I studied in graduate school, which is conservation biological control. We're going to preserve and enhance existing natural enemies. And sometimes those have been introduced and other times they're native. Uh, there are some little parasitic wasps that have been introduced into agricultural systems and they're ubiquitous now and we welcome them. But this is really the only approach to pest control I know of. It creates a positive feedback loop. You reduce your pesticides and so you establish more of these natural enemies. And when you have more natural enemies, of course, they're eating the pests and you have less need to use pesticide and so on. So there are a lot of benefits in the ecosystem to this type of pest management. So of course, things like pollination and decomposition come into play. We're conserving soil. And my motive, as I talked about earlier, is to reduce pesticide use in the environment. And in the long term, we have broad societal benefits to reducing our pesticides in our human managed landscapes. So I'd like to talk a little bit about why grow native plants. When I worked at the Santa Barbara Botanic Garden, it that was an all native plant nursery and garden. And while I already liked native plants, I learned to like them even more and especially to appreciate the ecosystem benefits and the health that they are supporting. And I don't usually use the term, you know, native California plant, for instance, because California has so many diverse ecosystems and that's true of many of our states. And I tend to use the term regionally native now that, you know, what is appropriate to your local environment? but I am not a purist, I'm a gardener. 
And so, uh, for instance, uh, those big mop head hydrangeas that remind me of my grandmother provide no useful habitat in California. And yet I love them and I want to grow them. They remind me of my grandmother. And I do caution people about plants with berries. That is one of the um, ways that a lot of invasive plants get into our forests. They are transported by birds. So if you like to have buried plants, it is good to look for native plants, especially in that case. So a lot of what I'm talking about today is really based on coevolution, a word that we use easily now but actually wasn't even around in 1964, except in some obscure mathematical journals. So Paul Ehrlich, who was the author of The Population Bomb, was an entomologist, and Peter Raven is a botanist. And they really wrote their seminal paper on this topic, Butterflies and Plants, a study in coevolution at the coffee table. When they were comparing how their caterpillars and the corresponding plants that they eat had evolved in a pattern in concert, so to speak. And it's interesting to me that they named this paper Butterflies and Plants. It was really about caterpillars and plants. It was about these larval host plants that are so important to many of these species. And what happens, of course, is that this caterpillar here, I gave you a monarch caterpillar because we're all familiar with them now and the fact that they eat milkweed. Uh, and the caterpillar, the species has evolved to overcome the toxin in the leaves. And as that happens, then the plants evolve to become more toxic. And once again, the caterpillars need to evolve to overcome that toxin. And this is why we get these really close relationships in what we call a evolutionary arms race and it leads to speciation and it leads to specialization and most of our herb of excuse me herbivora herbivorous insects actually are very closely tied to the plants they eat sometimes to a single species sometimes to a genus occasionally to an entire family of plants and many of the parasitoids and predators that then attack these herbivorous insects are also tied to them evolutionarily to some point or another. So the bottom line is native plants are superior in supporting biodiversity. Another word we're going to look at in a couple of minutes. Um, so let's just take a look at herbivorous insects here for a moment. And it's, some, it's something we don't talk a lot about in horticulture, that insects that are eating our plants are desirable. I think Doug Tallamy has done wonders for uh, the perception that a lot of us have about how important these insects are. You cannot have a butterfly garden if you don't have caterpillars. The key thing right here, I think, is that plants are converting the sun's energy to provide nutrients to virtually all planetary life, either directly or indirectly. So the herbivorous insects are directly feeding on the plants and then everything else is feeding on the insects, whether it is a pathogen that's attacking the insect or a predator, um, birds as we know, like to eat insects. And we're going to just take another look at this because I know a lot of people say insects but we all love birds. 96% of our terrestrial birds are feeding their young arthropods which are insects and related species and half of their diet is Lepidoptera so that are, is the moths and the butterflies many of which are really closely allied with native plants and birds are providing us with a tremendous amount of pest control. I always have to look at this number because I can't keep it in my head. $16 trillion of ecosystem services a year worldwide in pest control is from birds. So this is all connected. You tug at a thread on the edge of a web and it reverberates throughout the food web. And we all know by now that to have a healthy garden, 
we really need to promote biodiversity, a great variety of plants and animals and other organisms. But we rarely stop to think, what is biodiversity exactly? Usually what we're thinking about is species richness, the number of species that is present in the environment. But clearly if there's only one individual of each species, that is not a really healthy environment. So we also take into account abundance, the number of individuals of each species that is present. And that's more important than species richness alone. And one thing I learned when I took ecology was, boy, there's a lot of math in ecology. It is not a touchy feely science at all. And there are many different ways that biodiversity can be calculated. Uh, using these different factors that we're looking at. Because another factor is also the identity of the species in the system and what role it's playing. This, by the way, is a ladybug pupa right there. So what we are really looking for are, is insurance species because that provides us something called high functional group biodiversity. And the example I will use then is aphids. A lot of things eat aphids. Several different species of ladybugs eat aphids, um, lace wing insects, parasitoid wasps, surfid fly larvae, hummingbirds like to feed their babies aphids. So what happens is that if one species falls out of the system due to a pathogen or for whatever other environmental reason, say it falls out of the system, you have other species that can step in and provide that role of eating aphids. And what that means is that we end up with a resilient system, the ability for it to bounce back from disturbance. And of course, we're always disturbing the environment when we are gardeners. And so it's really important to us that we have this high functional group biodiversity and a resilient landscape that bounces back from disturbance. There's a lot of factors that promote biodiversity. And this is one of the reasons there's not been a lot of research done in agricultural systems on conservation biological control. Because you can see that oftentimes in agriculture, you're dealing with an annual system. For instance, you're growing a big field of lettuce. You're clearly disturbing and tilling the soil and it's difficult to have a lot of complexity unless you have small fields and hedgerows. So what we want to do is provide resources such as water, food, and shelter. Well, these are all features of our gardens and quite easy to manipulate in order to be able to stop using pesticides and welcome most of the critters that live in the garden. So how do insects feed on plants? I always like to point out something we don't think about a lot when we think insects feed on plants is that pollinators are feeding on plants. They are feeding on nectar and pollen. And so I like to take a look at that first. And by the way, on this milkweed plant, which has very small flowers, that's a tiny little bee down there, a native bee on one of the blossoms. So this is what we're usually thinking about, right? Here's some caterpillars and they've been munching these green leaves here. And this is a good time for me to point out that caterpillars are very tasty. If you're a bird or possibly a lizard, a spider, a hunting wasp. And so many herbivorous insects are very good at hiding as these green caterpillars are. They spend their day hiding under the leaf here and line themselves up on the midrib and they come out and feed at night. And this is true for many herbivorous insects. They feed at night. So if you're not sure what's eating your plants, go out with flashlight at night. Now I would like to look at these flowers on the right here. These are clarkias. And there's a little bee in the middle of one of them. It's a leaf cutter bee. And the leaf cutter bees will cut these little ovals out of leaves. They like things in the rose family often, or uh, they like these clarkias in my garden, and they cut out these little ovals to line their nests with. And so, you know, this starts to bring up a question for us. Well, is this a pest or is it a beneficial? It's pollinating, 
but it's eating our flowers. And here on the left, we have this little slug-like creature, and that is the larva of a flower fly or surfeit fly, sometimes called hoverfly too. Sometimes people kill these larvae. Well, they look kind of ugly. And oftentimes the beneficial insects, it's really the larvae that are doing the work. And so it's good to know before we kill what we are swishing. Generally speaking, if you have, think about the tiger in the jungle, there's one tiger and there's many prey. And the same is true in the insect world. If you don't see a lot of something, it's probably not a pest. And I show you this, this is a bay leaf on the right and the moth that makes these little packages is rarely noticed by anybody. I actually find the geometry of this package is quite lovely. And in the middle here, we have a spider that caught a fly. The fly could be a pollinator or it could be a predator of some kind. Uh, now the spider has caught his lunch and a bird could swoop down and eat them both. So I try and think more about different organisms in my garden in terms of their ecological roles rather than pest or beneficial, which is really a kind of human construct. And so I try and think about predators and parasitoids and decomposers. And that's how we're going to look at things going forward. Now, I still use the word pest. Sometimes there's different creatures that behave as pests in our garden for one reason or another. Um, usually they are, the pests are from somewhere else and they don't have a lot of natural enemies to control them. But another thing that is starting to factor in is climate change, which is kind of disturbing a lot of the populations of insects about. So I'm gonna take a moment and have a sip of water. And now we're gonna be following the sections of the book a bit. And I'm just gonna tell you briefly about those sections. This is a sand wasp right here. It's a solitary wasp. And um, we are going to, I'm gonna look at my notes for a minute, make sure I tell you what I want. And yes, I knew I was forgetting something. Okay, this is the part where I do a little reading from my book. It's the only place where I do a reading. And this is, as I said, earth, soil is very important. And so this is the introduction to the section beneath our feet. The air into which plants extend their stems, leaves, flowers, and fruit is a virtual desert compared to the soil in which their roots seek anchorage, water, and nourishment. This is why the health and sustainability of any landscape begins with stewardship of its most valuable resource, the soil underfoot. Soil is not simply a canvas on which we paint our beautiful plant picture, but a living substrate. A good gardener, before anything else, tends the soil, the foundation of the landscape. We think that we are growing plants, but really we are growing soil. When we proudly show off our prized tomatoes, we could just as proudly show off a handful of the fertile soil from whence they came. Fertile soil includes a complement of humus, organic matter that has decomposed until it has reached a stable state. We have many garden allies, seen and unseen, to thank for that. As Leonardo da Vinci remarked long ago, we know more about the movement of celestial bodies than about the soil underfoot. It is still true today. Just about every available surface under our feet is teeming with life. Incredibly, even the thin film of water that coats soil particles and lines pores in the soil harbors microscopic organisms that navigate those minute spaces. Fascinating stories emerge from the soil. And we are going to move forward and hear a few stories. This is the only drawing that was not done by my friend Craig Latker. This is by Jim Nardi, who wrote a book called Life in the Soil, A Guide for Naturalists and Gardeners. I love his book, and I really love this drawing. Every time I look at it, every time I've given this talk, 
I've been using this drawing for years now, and it still just boggles my mind to see these numbers, that one cup of undisturbed native soil could hold this much life. 100,000 meters of fungi. It's extraordinary. And there are many, many tiny creatures that live in the soil that we never notice. This is a columbola on the left, a little springtail. And the pseudoscorpion, despite looking really frightening, is very, very small and it preys on even tinier organisms. So we're gonna take a look quickly at earthworms because earthworms, night crawlers, you may know them as, are not native. And I know they've especially been a problem out on the East Coast in places where they have invaded the forest. And they pull the mulch and the leaf litter down into their very deep burrows and is having a huge impact on wildflowers. So I always suggest don't leave your bait out in the woods if you like to fish. And otherwise, we do welcome earthworms in our gardens and our agricultural fields where they already exist anyway. This is an earthworm egg on the right. And you may know that earthworms produce castings. Each earthworm can produce up to 10 pounds of castings annually. And in doing so, they are accelerating decomposition and they're creating tunnels. And those tunnels are channels for the penetration of roots, water, air, nutrients, and it's one of the reasons why I am a big advocate of no till. It doesn't mean you can never till, and there are times when, you know, you want to break up a fresh piece of ground that's really compacted, but generally speaking, I simply add compost to the top, and I let the worms do the work of mixing it in. One of the things that James Nardi says that um, has always stuck with me is that without life, soil is just crushed rock. And so all of this life, decomposers and nutrient facilitators are all creating soil. And oftentimes these decomposers are the same thing as nutrient facilitators. Um, here's some fungi on a cut piece of wood. And over here on the right, we have some nodules created by rhizobia bacteria. The plant has created a nodule here and the bacteria is inside and they're nitrogen fixing bacteria. And after this plant dies, the nodules will decompose and provide nitrogen to the next crop. On the wing, so I didn't have a chapter on pollinators because so many other organisms visit flowers. <clears throat> And there is quite a bit of overlap you will find in these different categories. An insect may be a flower visitor and may also appear in a section on parasitoids. And at some point I have to decide where does everything kind of fit? So all of these insects invariably visit flowers. And this is why you will find hunting wasps in this section and the parasitic wasps in a different section. So before we kind of get started with our flower visitors, I just want to point out that nectar is like soda pop. It's sugar water with a few minerals and the pollen is protein. So not all insects are feeding on the protein. A lot of them are just using nectar, which is they're using for energy. I don't talk a lot about floral resources in this talk. But generally speaking, if you rely on a number of families, you will have floral resources in your garden. And that would be the aster family, the parsley family, and that can include letting a number of your herbs go to seed. Mints family, which includes salvias and a lot of the Mediterranean herbs, the mustard family, and the rose family. But I don't overlook things that are wind pollinated, like willows, for instance, still produce nectar and they provide early season pollen and nectar for a lot of organisms. And also a number of the perennial grasses provide early season pollen. And then you're looking for, generally speaking, flowers that are pretty open so that insects can access those. 
things that, so you have things blooming over oh, as long of a season as possible. A lot of insects like patches because they're trying to save energy. So they would rather visit a patch than scattered plants. And wildflowers are always wonderful. Oops. Here. Okay. All right. So we are going to talk about bees briefly because bees are, after all, the most important pollinators we have. And they are the only insect that is purposely collecting pollen and carrying it to a different site. They also are made for carrying pollen. They have branched hairs, especially on their thorax, which you probably would need magnification to see. And they have an electrostatic charge. So they're like a pollen magnet. And there are over 4,000 species of native bees in the United States. Honeybees are not among them, but we have many native bees and they perform some really important pollinating services for both our native plants and our agricultural crops. So the solitary bees have no real use for males in the nest. The females build their nest and they lay their eggs and they um, supply pollen and nectar and the males have to sleep outside. And that's what these males are doing. These are sunflower longhorn bees. And at night you can find them clustered this way sometimes on a stem. So the Lepidoptera, moths and butterflies. It may surprise you to learn that 90% of the Lepidoptera are moths, but since moths are nocturnal and so many of them are tiny and brown, we don't really notice them as much as we do the butterflies, which tend to be day flying and far more colorful and interesting to look at. However, they are not necessarily good pollinators. A lot of the moths are very good pollinators and they get deep into flowers, but many of the butterflies perch on top of flowers. And monarch butterflies, which are the stars of many a pollinator garden, are actually really poor pollinators. They are important for other reasons. And we're really planting milkweed for the caterpillars. Uh, the adult monarchs will nectar on all kinds of flowers. So plant larval host plants. So the hunting wasps, as I mentioned, are actually flower visitors. As adults, they feed on nectar and they prey on all kinds of different insects. Um, there are spider hunters and caterpillar hunters. And some of them are attacking true bugs. And what they will do is parasitize their prey and stock the nest with it. So the prey is still alive. And when the larva hatches out, it eats the prey, generally starting with the non-vital parts and leaving the vital organs for last. It's all fairly gruesome. And uh, insects do have some wonderful stories. So we have here two different hunting wasps and the wasp larvae are carnivorous. And it's one of the things that distinguishes wasps from bees is that bees are herbivorous. They're vegetarians, they're feeding their larvae pollen and nectar, and the wasps are feeding their babies meat, essentially. And then we have the flies. So, you know, we, flies have a bad reputation, but actually they're very important in the garden. Some of them are very important pollinators. Many of them are important parasitoids and predators that are controlling other insects in your garden. So on the right here is a flower fly or surfeit fly. And these come in many different sizes and slightly different shapes. They usually have kind of a convex, concave, concave abdomen. And they are almost always bee and wasp mimics, but you will see that they hover above the flowers. They are really important pollinators and they are also very important predators. They lay their eggs near the prey and the larvae hatch out and they come and attack the prey. On the other hand, some flies are 
parasitoids, as is this tachinid fly on the left. And we will be looking at this more closely in a moment. So, so this is a little surfeit fly and it is pollinating an orchid. Orchids have all kinds of strange pollination mechanisms. And this fly flies into the orchid and the orchid slaps down these little pollinia, which are a pollen packet on the back of the surfeit fly, which then flies off to the next flower and repeats the same thing. And a friend sent me this photo and I couldn't believe how many pollinia are on this poor fly. I don't even know how it can fly. So let's dig a little bit deeper here into predators and parasites. So this is a predator. This is a robber fly here. And during its lifetime, it will kill and eat many individuals. And that sets it apart as a predator. But I want to take a slightly closer look at parasites and parasitoids. And while we're on the subject, there is a really strong selection that goes on among the herbivorous insects to avoid predation. And this is why so many of them are good uh, mimics or they have chemical defenses and a variety of other strategies for avoiding being eaten. So let's take a look at these flies for a moment. Oops, I'm sorry. I'm gonna just stay on this picture for a moment. Um, let's talk about parasites and parasitoids for a moment. A parasite will live on or inside its host. And it is usually far smaller than the host. It rarely kills its host. So think of diseases like malaria, for instance. Uh, you can't have the organism that causes malaria killing the host because then the organism dies as well. And it is bound to its host for its entire life cycle, although it could move from host to host, usually as a larva. But a parasitoid adult may be much larger than the host. And while the larvae will live on or inside a host, the key is that there is a free living adult stage. And parasitoids are almost always insects. They're usually flies and wasps and they do kill the host almost invariably. So now I wanted to look at these two groups. On the left, this is a tachinid fly, which is a parasitoid, and the bee fly on the right here is a parasitoid as well. And the bee flies are also an important pollinator, and the tachinid flies can behave as a pollinator as well. So while the tachinid fly on the left is usually parasitizing insects that we would like them to parasitize, there are also tachinid flies that parasitize monarch caterpillars. And on the right, this bee fly, although it's an important pollinator, parasitizes ground nesting bees and wasps, which we usually are welcoming to the garden. So that's why I like to kind of take a food web, web approach to my garden and figure everything is food or something else. Nature is quite complicated. So a lot of the parasitoids are wasps, and these are not photographs of the smallest of them. The smallest parasitoids are so small that they can parasitize butterfly eggs, and they will look like dust motes floating around in your garden. They are pushing the boundaries of how small you can be and still have systems. They are amazingly small. And now we're going to meet the beetles briefly. This is an ornate checkered beetle here. And they're wonderful because they're predaceous as larvae and adults. And a lot of the beetles like to have some late blooming flowers such as goldenrod, which does not produce hay fever and yarrow. They like clusters of small flowers oftentimes, but they also like early blooming grasses. A lot of them feed on pollen as adults. Many of them want to pupate in, in leaf litter or live under logs or rocks. So the habitat requirements go far beyond just flowers. We only have time to meet a couple of the beetles here. And 
um, this one on the left here is feasting on oleander aphids, which are eating milkweed. And on the right, this is a mealybug destroyer, which is a small adult. Lady beetles come in many different sizes. And there are black ones, and there are some that are kind of a pale blonde color. Some have spots, some don't. And you can see the larva of the mealybug destroyer looks a lot like a mealybug. It is your classic sheep in wolf's clothing and eats its prey with impunity. And many of the lady beetles eat things other than aphids, by the way. They eat all kinds of mealybugs and scale insects and other small, soft bodied insects. And then there's soldier beetles. You won't hear farmers talk a lot about soldier beetles because they like to pupate in leaf litter, but they are a fantastic beneficial insect, great for gardens. And the larvae will also be in the soil as well. And they do come in different species on the East Coast. These are a couple West Coast species that I have photographed here. They are predators as both adult and larvae, and they prey on aphids, caterpillars, grasshopper eggs, mites, other small insects, cucumber beetles. We love our soldier beetles. This is a predaceous ground beetle here. Look at those giant mandibles. They look quite similar to darkling beetles. And these are both nocturnal. And most of these dark colored beetles are nocturnal. We don't really notice them, but your garden, I guarantee you, is full of predaceous ground beetles. And the way to tell them apart is that the darkling beetles, which eat vegetation, sometimes move slowly because they're herbivores. They're like a, a cow. Whereas the predaceous ground beetle is a running hunting beetle. And so you can recognize them by his gait. And I do recommend going out in the garden with a flashlight on a warm summer night. You'll see all kinds of things going on there. And the leaf beetles are controlling weeds. This is the Klamath weed beetle. It was introduced to control Klamath weed which is a type of St. John's wort and it is toxic to rangeland cattle. It's been incredibly successful. We have some weevils that have been introduced for weed control too. So let's move on. There are of course many other beetles. We're gonna look at a couple, just a couple of these other familiar garden insects. There are many more in the book. This is an ambush bug. I love ambush bugs and they look like little dinosaurs to me. And the true bugs, and many people call all insects bugs, and I uh, don't have a problem with that. I know some entomologists do, but you will hear them refer to true bugs, by which they mean insects with these piercing, sucking mouth parts. And you can see on the right, it's folded underneath this herbivorous insect. And on the left, this predator has stuck his beak right into an insect. The true bugs are really good food for many birds and other organisms, by the way. And as I mentioned before, one way to tell the good guys from the bad guys, because I'm often asked, is that if you have a bug that is behaving as a pest, it will probably be there in far more abundance than the predators. And the true bugs, which used to be in a big group called the homoptera that has since been divided into several unrelated groups, are still good for us to consider as a whole because it includes a lot of the things that bother us in our garden, right? The aphids, mealybugs, scale insects, white flies, uh, tree hoppers, frog hoppers, plant hoppers. And many of these produce sugars that attract ants. And the ants will protect their herds of these sugar producing insects from any natural enemies that come along. And that's what this ant is doing, is rushing up to try and attack this ladybug. So if you're having problems with some of these homopteran groups, sometimes what you really need to do is to control the ants so that then the predators and parasitoids can come in and control the aphids, for instance. And here's something we don't often consider, which is that dragonflies can eat their weight in mosquitoes on a daily basis, and they're very easy to attract to the garden with a water feature. So I think they are an unsung hero, and I enjoy watching them as much as I do hummingbirds.
The Orthoptera, the musicians, I think of them as, are very good at hiding because if you're a bird, I guess they're delicious. This is a cave you did on the right, and this is a little desert grasshopper on the left hiding and doing a pretty good job of it. The mantises are generalist predators. I usually recommend that people not purchase the egg cases, which are of the Chinese mantids. They're big and they compete with our native mantids. But if you already have these in your garden, you may as well enjoy them. They are there to stay. Most of the United States, you can find the native Carolina mantis though, and it is worth encouraging that one. Lace wings are one of the only insects I think is worth buying for the garden because you will establish a permanent population if you do that. And you can get them as eggs, as larvae, as adults. The larvae are voracious feeders of aphids and the adults are nocturnal. They'll come to your porch lights or you may see them feeding at flowers sometimes. The ground crew and beyond includes the non-insect vertebrates. This is a jumping spider here. And it includes also millipedes, which again, they're herbivorous and slower moving and the centipedes, which are a fast moving predator. They can sting. So yes, maybe you want to leave them alone while they do their work and don't pick those up. Um, in the book, I also cover snails and slugs galls and pathogens and go into spiders and go into spiders in some depth. Right now, I'm just going to say they really are valuable garden predators. Most of them are quite shy. Most can't pierce human skin. And some of them are truly beautiful. And then there are the vertebrates. I don't welcome deer, but I do welcome many others. And of course, Here's where we're really getting away from the use of flowers as a way to bring beneficial organisms into the garden because these have different habitat needs, water, shelter, brush piles, rocks, logs, and amphibians, as you may know, very sensitive to pesticides. So if you want to encourage frogs in your garden, you really want to uh, scale back on the pesticides. And you may or may not have turtles in your garden. Uh, you may have some lizards. Many people have snakes. Most of them are quite harmless. Um, there are a number of rescue operations that will come and get venomous snakes if that's a problem. And the birds, birds of course may nibble your plants sometimes, but I think most of us welcome them into the garden. And you can do that with bird baths and putting your vegetation into kind of a ladder. So I just have a couple more things here and then we're going to wrap up. What can you do? You could put up a bat house. You can plant native plants, especially. And if you put in habitat garden, consider putting it in, in your front yard. Many organizations now have wonderful signage that you can put up and maybe your neighbors will come and want to know what are you doing there? Be observant about what is going on in your garden. Sit quietly. I like to use close focusing binoculars, which you can get quite inexpensively now. And you can just sit in your garden and get a really close up look at what is going on. Visit gardens and look at what's going on. Some signage is really good now in the botanic gardens. So be an example, be an example. And then you can be a beautiful example. Uh, Master Gardener is one of our largest volunteer organizations in the country, is one great way to contribute to improving the sustainability of our landscapes. Join our volunteer botanic gardens, native plant societies, school gardens always need you. Join iNaturalist. Even if you aren't contributing as Bonnie Nickel did to something brand new, it is a great way to get your insects identified and you can do a search on inaturalist.org for your own region. Bugguide.net is an excellent resource as well. Turn off the lights. If you want more information, go to darksky.org, but clearly if you're a nocturnal organism, all of this light's not wonderful. Uh, some municipalities now are asking people to please have all their lighting 
facing downward. Plant natives, I might have mentioned that. I, here's my book. I was thrilled to have Doug Tallamy's endorsement for my book. Um, you can find me on Facebook, on Instagram. I don't have the website up yet, and I'm working on that. And I want to leave you with this quote that I live by in my garden. When we tug at a single thing in nature, we find it attached to the rest of the world by John Muir. Um, okay, we did get a few questions. That was wonderful. You are a wealth of information. And um, the first question we have that somebody get put in this afternoon is, what is the difference between a wasp and a bee? And are wasps as good as bees? Ah, yes. Well, yeah, so bees actually evolved from wasps. Um, originally. I think the thought is that wasps were getting pollen on their bodies and, you know, somehow this all evolved into uh, pollen feeding insects. And the wasps, you probably have noticed wasps have shinier, smoother bodies and they're not as good at picking up pollen. So while they may behave as pollinators, primarily they are useful to us as predators of insects that we might not be welcoming as much, caterpillars or true bugs, or I like it that some of them get stink bugs. And um, so, the, and, but really the principal difference is that bees are vegetarians. They feed exclusively on pollen and nectar. And the wasps are carnivorous, feeding on insects and mm. spiders, except for one very small group called pollen wasps. So one of the difficulties with biology is that there are exceptions to everything. And so there are pollen wasps out there. There's a small group. Um, we have a few questions that came in. What do you do if you have an infestation of not good insects that is out of balance and want to get the natural balance back in order? Yes, and that does happen. And it especially happens if you have a garden where pesticides had been used or you inherited a garden and it's all just, you know, there's a couple of junipers and a hydrangea and, and lawn and you're trying to, to, to put in habitat. Things can go out of balance. I try and be very targeted in my approach to that. I have a couple of favorite products. One of them is Safer Soap. I don't use household detergent in my garden, um, but I will get a little spray bottle of Safer Soap as I said, a lot of the times these pests are nocturnal. So um, I don't have as much energy as I used to, but I used to go out before bed and, um, and squirt earwigs with soap. And so there's that. Uh, one way to deal with snails is sluggo, uh, which is oh. degrades into iron oxide and is, you know, I don't want my pests to eat it, but it is purportedly harmless to them. But again, I look for like, where am I having snail? problems. Sluggo is expensive. I don't just sprinkle it all over my garden. Um, and another way to deal with snails and slugs, by the way, snails only feed once every few days. So you go out every single night for about a week and collect every snail you find, big and small, and feed them to the chickens. And you actually get good relief for quite a while uh, that way. The snail hunter. Um, are dragonflies migratory? Oh, that's a good question. Some of them are. Um, I, you know, most dragonflies are actually tropical uh, in nature. So that is a really good question. I know some of them are migratory and now I'm trying to think, are they all migratory? I don't think so. Uh, I do know that some of them will live in the larval stage in the water for a number of years before they emerge as adults. And the larvae also like to eat mosquito larvae. And one of the ways, though, that I control mosquito larvae in my garden projects is they have those little donuts that are actually a bacteria, right? A bacillus thuringiensis israelensis. But they call them, so you can see why they call them donuts. Um, but it's just a bacteria, and it really only kills mosquito larvae, and it still leaves lots of other insects for dragonflies to eat. And fewer mosquito larvae to pester us. Um, here's another one. Um, how does the changing climate of California, especially droughts and wildfires, affect typical backyards and your backyard? Makes me want to move to Washington. Um, but 
<laughs> it is an incredible challenge for everybody. And I think that for many of us who have lived sometimes on a property for decades, and we didn't used to have these fires. Mm -hmm. And so now we're looking around our yards and thinking, oh, we need to take this tree down. I have a friend who just took out a bunch of conifers near her swimming pool and it, it broke her heart, but her son works on the fire crews and said, you know, mom, you have to take these out. So the landscapes are changing and we are learning more and more. How, how can we make beautiful gardens despite having to combat these issues? Yeah. Some plants um, are more adaptable than others. Someone asked, is the declining number of birds directly related to the pesticide use? Yes. Yeah. I mean, that's my, you know, I, I think I could go out there and pull all the studies for you that show, yes. And yeah. uh, it's, it's, it's very difficult to shift the ship that is the way that we do agriculture. Uh, which is giant monocultures, generally speaking, and that what we really need is smaller fields, of, a little more diverse, and hedgerows that provide habitat. Um, someone asked about peonies. When you see the ants all over the peonies, are they eating aphids, and what do aphids do? Why do we like them or not like them? We love peonies and we hate that when we put them in the vase, the ants come out. Peonies actually, um, I think they're one of the plants that actually has nectaries near the leaf bases. I know peaches do too. Huh. Some plants actually have little nectaries at the base of leaves. And so the ants are seeking sugar, whether it's from the aphids or the nectaries. And you know, the only way I know to deal with that is to control the ants at the base of the plant, right? I tend to use taro or some other borax bait of oh, interesting. some kind, you know? And then yeah, for trees, people, people use tanglefoot, but um, uh, it's messy. Uh, along that line, you kind of answered this, but <clears throat> does soap, water, hot pepper work as pesticide? Soapy water, if it's safer soap, um, you know, I know that there are a lot of reasons to not use regular dish detergent and a, a bottle of safer soap will last you <clears throat> a long time. And yes, hot peppers works on some things, uh -huh. but if, you know, if you were trying to repel birds, hot peppers wouldn't work at all. They eat them. So <laughs> they, they're, they like a hot, spicy giant. Yeah. Um, here's a one. We get this question all the time when people are coming in talking about gardening. How do lawn, lawns? help or hinder the good insects? Ooh. So lawns are actually a monoculture. And, you know, I'm out here on the West Coast, so we're not giant fans of the lawn. Um, it, I think more and more people are looking at lawns as if you're using them to play sports or to play with the dog or your kids, then they have a purpose. But a uh, lawn that is there purely for decorative reasons, it, it is a monoculture. It's really not good for beneficial insects. Now, we all know the lightning bugs. We don't have lightning. We don't have fireflies out here. The fireflies seem to like the, the lawns and the grasses. So um, I can't totally speak to lawns uh, in the east, but they are not a biodiverse environment. Um, we have another question that someone just sent in. What is your favorite insect? Oh, on the spot. This is like asking me who my favorite child is. Um, <laughs> I love snowy tree crickets. They live up in the trees. That's the cricket you may have heard where you can tell, you know, what the temperature is by counting the number of chirps. They have a really soft trill that I like. And when kids come over, it's fun to go out with a flashlight and look for them. And so um, I'd be a snowy tree cricket if I had to be an insect. <laughs> Someone wanted to know if you would talk a little bit about the declining uh, population of monarch butterflies. Yes, yeah, it's, it's so curious. We actually had a really good uh, bunch of monarch butterflies out here in California. The previous year, there were almost none. And then this past winter, when they were counting, we had a resurgence. So there are 
you know, if you're looking at a graph of the decline of insects, you will see that there is a general downward trend, but we still get these bumps where it's okay in some years. And I think that the, the part of our problem here out West has to do with not having nectar corridors. So many people are planting milkweed for the larvae that they're neglecting to plant nectars, nectar for the adults. And so I know on the East Coast that during the migration of the monarchs, they may have several different generations as they're heading south. So they need food for both the larvae, so the milkweed, plant native, and they, but they also need nectar plants so that the adults have food for their journey. Wow. Um, I think we've come to the end of our hour. I want to show everyone the beautiful book again, which you saw the, some of the illustrations, but it is, it's a real treasure. And Barrett Bookstore has it on the shelves and they will also do a web order for you tonight. I think we've answered all our questions that people sent in. And I, I, it's just a wonderful book and such a great spinoff for the beginning of garden season. Yeah. So, yeah. Thank you for joining us and good luck with your yeah. move. Thank you. And thank you so much for having me. It's such a pleasure to speak to an audience across the country. Oh, thank you. All right, everyone. Say, we'll say good night and we'll see you next week for some more great programming. Okay. Thanks, Frederic. Okay, thank you. Good night.